Okay, uh, thank you again to everyone who submitted poster pitches. Uh, next, we are being joined remotely by Mafalda Diaz uh, from Harvard Medical School, and she's going to talk about predicting the effect of genetic variation using deep generative models. Okay, uh, thank you again. Uh, we're being joined by Mafalda Diaz uh, from Harvard Medical School. Uh, hi, let me uh, share my screen. Um, sorry. All right. Yeah, uh, I'm a founder. I'm a postdoc at Debbie Marx's group at Harvard Medical School. I am very sad to not be able to be with you in Toronto, but I'm happy to be participating online. It's been so far a great meeting. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about the great potential of modeling sequences for predicting the pathogenicity of human genetic variation. And when I talk about sequences, I'm not just talking about uh, sequences in uh, the human population for which we have more and more data available, but I am primarily talking about sequences across uh, diverse organisms. And there is a wealth of data there. I mean, just in Uniprot, there's over 250 million protein sequences across more than 140,000 organisms, not even mentioning the plans of the Earth Biogenome Project to sequence all eukaryotes on Earth. Uh, the idea of using uh, conservation across evolution for predicting the pathogenicity of variants is not new. I'm sure that you are all familiar with tools like SIFT and Polyphen, but recently there's been a lot of development in uh, deep generative modeling, specifically for uh, biological sequence data, and they've been sure to be extremely successful for lots of applications such as protein design, pathogen evolution, uh, structure prediction, et cetera. This is something that we work actively on in our group. And the question that I'm asking today is how does this progress translate to the question of predicting the pathogenicity of human variation? So the idea of using deep generative models to look at sequences across organisms uh, is quite intuitive. So when we're looking at sequences across distant organisms, we're looking at uh, sequences that have undertaken millions of years of evolutionary experiments. So if we manage to capture the distribution of these sequences, we will be able to capture the patterns that are important and have been conserved. And these can be very complex patterns amongst uh, uh, sequence positions uh, that have been conserved throughout evolution. And this is exactly what the generative model does. A generative model is a model that describes the distribution of sequences. So we'll have a model of this type where uh, X is, the is just the sequence data and theta are the parameter models. And once we have this such a model, then we can inquire if a new sequence, like a human sequence with a variant we've never seen, how likely it is under the model. And the idea of using these models is that the least probable a sequence is, uh, the less fit it is, and the more as probability to be associated with disease it is. And we can build a score of pathogenicity built on the, uh, upon the probabilities of seeing uh, these uh, variant uh, sequence over the se probability of seeing the reference sequence. Very similar to what Preston was talking about this morning. So in terms of modeling, the idea is to move away from column conservation and look at models that take into consideration complex uh, dependencies along uh, the protein sequence. And the, pro uh, the community has, grossly speaking, moved into two directions. One of them is to uh, look at uh, alignment independent models inspired by natural language processing. And the other direction is to look at uh, models based on sequ multiple sequence alignments like latent variable models. I'll be primarily talking about a model of this type, but we recently had some work on a natural language, whoop, sorry, on a natural language model. So if you're interested, please have a look at the, our paper and get into touch. 
So variational on-tweak orders or latent variable models uh, try to solve the problem of modeling high dimensional, discrete and super sparse data by assuming that it can be described in a lower dimensional continuous space that I'm calling here Z. And if we describe the relationship along sequence space with this latent variable Z as a totally non-linear, fully connected neural net, then this model is extremely expressive and can capture very complex dependencies along the sequence. And this is what we've done in a recent work in a model that we called EVE for short. We applied such a model to about 3000 disease genes and we built a pathogenicity score built upon this ratio that I just talked about. So the question is, how can we validate a model of this type? The validation of in silico models, just like Claire yesterday in the morning uh, was talking about, is very hard and very important. And a model of this type has the advantage of, because it is trained exclusively on sequences across diverse organisms, we can use the entirety of known clinical annotations for doing validation instead of just like 10%. Uh, so what, this is what we've done, and we computed the UC over these uh, clean fire annotations, and uh, we see that our average UC is about 0 0.92. Of course, the clinical annotations are just not like true, true, also like Claire mentioned yesterday. And also you might be wondering that maybe there's some circularity in this validation because some of these clinical annotations use conservation for uh, being built in the first place. So we can use different orthogonal validation for our models, for example, comparing against MAPES. This is what we've done here. So here in the y-axis, this is a, a average Spearman correlation against MAVES done in human genes. And this is just average AUC on clean fire annotation. And we see that our model has state of art performance. OK, so we're talking about MAVES as something that we can compare our model against for validation. But really, MAVES also try to predict the pathogenicity of um, the variants. So we can compare our performance at predicting um, pathogenicity of variants with the performance of MAVES that's predicting the same thing. And this is what is shown here for P53. Here uh, in the x-axis is just position along sequence space. This is the score of our model where one is more pathogenic. And this is the experimental score from uh, one of the experiments from Giacomelli et al. And what we see uh, here, uh, these dots are all uh, pathogenic and benign labels from clean bar. And what we see is that our AUC is slightly higher than the one of the experiment. And really, when we look amongst loads of different MAVs, we find that systematically our model compares, uh, performs on par to experiments. And this is something that for us was really exciting because MAVs and a model that is based only trained on sequences across evolution are completely orthogonal sources of evidence. So they can be used in combination and synergistically, not just to uh, classify uh, variants of a known significance, but also synergistically more like uh, Jacob Kitzman was talking yesterday by looking at the agreements and disagreements, trying to identify what are the variants that should be looked into more, uh, more care. And this idea of variant prioritization and Bayesian experiment design is something that we're very excited about and that we think that will be very important, especially when we want to build experiments to uh, test epistasis. So if you're interested in this, please uh, get in touch. And before finishing, I would just like to mention three considerations when trying to incorporate an in silico model like this into a classification scheme. Like we heard some uh, in detail throughout this uh, workshop, um, classification schemes uh, uh, try to identify all the orthogonal sources of evidence and attribute a weight for each of these evidence towards variant classification. So when we want to um, incorporate an in silico model in such a scheme, we need to identify what is the evidence that was behind this in silico model. A lot of classification schemes currently lump all in silico prediction as just like one uh, unique evidence, but we feel like this is kind of like a shame because different models are trained on completely different data. And there are models that can be completely orthogonal to each other if they're trained on, for example, structure data or imputation from MAPES. So uh, identifying which evidence went to build the model, I, we believe is very important for incorporation in a classification scheme. Secondly, the weight that uh, the evidence will take is, goes hand in hand with how robust and systematic the validation can be done. And uh, so it's very important to also acknowledge what, uh, what's been used, uh, what is the data and what is the evidence used in training to avoid all types of uh, circulation in the validation sorry, circularities in the validation. And last but not least, 
we believe that this validation is best done on a gene by gene basis because different genes have more data for validation and more genes will feel more confident and more they will have more robust validation. So if gene by if validation should be done gene by gene, then the strength of evidence should also vary in a gene by gene basis. And this is something that we think that um, should also be taken in consideration. Okay, so I'm already slightly over time. So I'm just gonna leave you here with a summary, but I would just like to make some comments of looking ahead. So there will be a big update on our server where we release all of our results. We will have very soon uh, Eve results for the entirety of the um, human proteome. And uh, we're very interested, like I mentioned, about looking at epistasis. So far, I was only talking about predictions for single variants, but looking at epistasis and also identify variant prioritization for MAVES. This is a direction that we're very excited in the lab. Um, another thing that I, we haven't looked at all is that our scores are actually continuous, and we haven't investigated what this continuous score uh, means. Could it be related to variable risk per variant? Could it be uh, related to uh, association to different disease phenotypes? So this is something that we're also very interested in looking forward. Um, looking forward. And uh, obviously one of the directions that we're uh, actively pushing forward to is uh, building models beyond missense variants into regulatory regions. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much, Mafalda. Uh, I see we already have a couple of questions lined up. Hi, Mafalda. It's Benedetta. Great talk. I believe that Eve captures reasonably well um, the impact of mutations on the aggregation of amyloid beta. And I think that's great, but I want to understand it because, to my knowledge, it's hard to think that the peptide has evolved to aggregate. So I wonder what you think of this. Is it random? Is it interesting? Or is Eve capturing somehow the fact that a peptide has evolved not to aggregate? Yeah, so I find this extremely fascinating, honestly. And this is something that we've also seen with Tao. And um, it really, uh, if it is captured by the model and it is true, then it means that there has been some uh, evolutionary uh, function for this aggregation. And I think that this is something that is extremely interesting and that we should uh, look into more detail. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think we have no online questions. Thank you again, Mafalda. Thank you. Thank you. And